these certainly are some historic times. In fact, if you were to look at all the memes on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, and other social media platforms, uh, many warn that these are the quote-unquote last days and that all the quote-unquote signs of the end are starting to be made clear. In fact, some, even some well-known preachers and teachers are teaching this. Let me just say that we are in the last days. Uh, the last days are the period of time from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection until his return. So yes, we are in the last days. But what about his return? Does the Bible say anything about signs that will precede his return? Is it possible that the COVID-19 virus is one of those signs that will usher in his return? In a word, no. Certainly we are closer to his return today than we were yesterday. And, quite honestly, we'll be closer to his return tomorrow than we are today. But the idea that there will be signs to tell us when he will return is based on a misunderstanding and misapplication of various Bible verses and passages. Over the next couple of weeks, I want to take this opportunity in this time to share with you what some of these quote-unquote controversial passages are really teaching. Perhaps the most quote-unquote controversial book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. It's a book that is filled with symbols, dragons, beasts, lambs with seven eyes and seven horns, frogs, rivers turned to blood, and plenty of others. This book strikes fear into the heart of people. Fulfillment of prophecy and uh, of these prophecies in various times in history have been found and seen by many different scholars, and, and you know all of them slightly different times, slightly different uh, periods of time and, and events. But they all see the fulfillment of these prophecies in various events throughout history. You know, understanding the Book of Revelation is very simple, really. God wins. And if we want to win, we need to be on God's side, on God's team. One idea that has come from a misinterpretation of the book of Revelation is the idea that there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth. The only time the Bible ever uses the expression thousand-year reign is in Revelation chapter 20. Now, if we're going to properly understand what he means, John means, when he writes Revelation chapter 20, we have to be sure that we put that chapter in its proper context. Context is so important when you are interpreting and, and looking at and reading the Bible, especially when it comes to prophecies, especially when it comes to things that might be a little bit difficult to understand. You always have to make sure that you're understanding them in their proper context. As I mentioned, Revelation is highly symbolic. Not just the images are symbolic either. The numbers that are mentioned in the book are also symbolic. Things like 1,260 days, uh, 10 days, times, time, half a time. You know, th those are all very symbolic. So we need to use caution when we hear about the thousand year reign. You see, the book of Revelation is really a story about two beasts and a dragon who try to wipe out Christianity. If we are to understand what the thousand year reign does mean, we have to see where it fits in this overall story. In other words, we have to put it in the proper context. The book of Revelation is the account of a vision which the Apostle John received while in exile on the island of Patmos. Jesus appeared to him and told him to write down what he saw and send it to the seven churches in the province of Asia which is modern-day Turkey. These churches were already undergoing persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire, and according to the vision that John received, it was going to get worse before it got better. But in the end, those being persecuted would be rewarded, and those doing the persecuting would be punished. The basic story starts in Revelation chapter 4. The book of Revelation is written to encourage those early Christians during the terrible ordeal that they were facing. The theme of the book is put forth in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 
Here the souls of those already killed for the testimony about Jesus ask the question that the book of Revelation is written to answer. If you would look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar <clears throat> uh, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had been born. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Essentially their question is, God, why don't you use your power to stop those who are killing Christians? Well, the answer is given in verse 11. Each is given a white robe and told to wait just a little while longer that the persecution will continue until more Christians have been killed. Then in chapter 7, we see these martyrs again, now called a great multitude. They are wearing the white robes that they were given, and are serving before the throne of God, and are pictured at peace from their terrible ordeal. By the time we get to Revelation chapter 12, we are introduced to a great dragon who is identified as the devil and Satan. He, in verse 9 of chapter 12, he's seeking to overcome those who hold the testimony of Jesus. Chapter 12, verse 17. Well, the dragon's not dumb. The dragon knows that he can't do this all by himself. So in chapter 13, he brings up a beast to be his helper. This beast is quite um, impressive, maybe intimidating, we might say. He has seven heads. Each one representing a king, we find out in chapter 17, verse 10. Since one of these is said to be reigning when Revelation is being written, we know that the beast existed in the first century. Since this beast rules over every tribe, people, nation, and language, and since he makes war with the saints, chapter 13, verse 7 tells us, we have plenty of clues as to the identity of the beast. The beast is a political power with kings. The beast existed near the end of the first century. The beast ruled worldwide and forth the beast persecuted Christians. Now what power would and could fit this description? Could the United States fit that description? I don't think so. I mean the United States has only been in existence for 244 years. Maybe one of the presidents of the United States, regardless of political party or political ideology, you can put whichever president you want to in, and still it doesn't fit. What about Russia or some other world power of modern day? No, they, they, they didn't exist near the end of the first century. Uh, they don't rule worldwide. Perhaps there's another alternative. I believe that this fits very well with the Roman Empire. I believe that the beast in chapter 13 is the Roman Empire. So by chapter 14, the beast, the Roman Empire, has killed more for their testimony, and these have joined the souls from chapters 6 and 7. All of these now follow the Lamb and are pictured as being in heaven, which is referenced as Mount Zion. In chapter 15, this multitude is seen standing around the great sea of glass, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, chapter 15, verse 3. In chapter 16, the seven final bowls of wrath are poured out on the beast and his followers. By the time of the seventh bowl, the cry goes out, It is done, chapter 16, verse 17. God has now brought down the mighty persecuting empire. In Revelation 19, verse 2, the great multitude in heaven shouts, Hallelujah! Because God has now judged and avenged the blood of his servants. Remember chapter 10, verse, excuse me, remember chapter 6, verse 10? When will you judge and avenge? Well, now God has. In chapter 19, verse 14, Christ's army, the martyrs in their white robes, follow him as he goes forth in final victory over the beast and his ally, the false prophet, who killed those who would not worship one of the Roman emperors, back in chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. 
Well, that's the basic story of the book of Revelation. Well, naturally, there's a little more meat to it, but the basic story is something like that. In a nutshell, the struggle and strife of chapters 1 through 19 let us know the purpose of chapters 20 through 22. The purpose of chapters 20 through 22 is a victory party. God wins and he and his followers celebrate. But now we come to the difficult part in Revelation chapter 20 and the thousand year reign. Well, let's take a look and see what we read in Revelation 20 verses 4 through 6. It says, Then I saw thrones and seated on the, them were those whom with the authority to judge were committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. To understand this reign, we need to answer four basic questions. In journalism, they have the five W's. Who, what, when, where, why? Well, the what is the thousand year reign? Let's see if we can answer the other four the W's. Who reigns? Where do they reign? Why do they reign? And when do they reign? So let's take that first question. Who reigns? Those who reign are clearly identified in verse 4 as the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and those who had not worshipped the beast. In fact, if you read through the book of Revelation, especially chapter 20 here, you're, you'll find that no one else is mentioned as being involved in this reign with Christ except those who had resisted the efforts of the beast, the Roman Empire. They had cried out in chapter 6, verse 9, for God to act. And by chapter 19, verse 2, God had done what they asked. Now these same ones, the souls of the martyrs, reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now note that those who reign are in the status of souls. Their bodies have died for they've been beheaded. That they are described as souls indicates that they had not yet received their resurrected bodies and that they are between death and the resurrection. While their reign is called the first resurrection in chapter 20 verse 5, it is not a bodily resurrection but a figurative one in which even though they were killed for Christ, their souls are alive and are reigning with him. So who rules or who reigns? The souls of the martyrs who were killed by the beast. Second question, why do they reign? Since those who had been killed by the Roman Empire and who had therefore died in humiliation are seen here to be reigning after the Roman Empire has gone down in defeat, this reign is presented as a symbolic way of saying that those who appear to have been defeated by death will, in time, celebrate as victorious. Their defeat, their humiliation, is only temporary. They will be victorious. What greater reward could be promised to those who first received this book than to say that if they are willing to be faithful even unto death, that they will be allowed to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Seen in the context of the entire book of Revelation then, the thousand year reign is the promise that those who will suffer with Christ will someday reign with Christ, while the empire and the emperor who had killed them will go down to defeat. So who reigns? The souls of the martyrs. Why do they reign? They reign because they are victorious. The third question, where do they reign? Very important. We look again at Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 uh, and 
if you look in, in those verses, is there anything about where the rain takes place? There's not. So we must draw our conclusion from what the context, which is the rest of the book of Revelation, says about these three things, about three things that are involved in the rain. Number one, when we've seen the souls of the martyrs in chapters 6, 7, 14, 15, and 19, where were they? They were in heaven. Second question, when we have seen Christ before in chapters 5, 6, 8, 12, 14, and 19, where was he? In heaven. When we've seen thrones before in chapters 4, 5, 7, 12, and 19, where were they? That's right, they were in heaven. Since the souls of the martyrs, Christ and the thrones are the basic elements of the reign, and they are all in heaven, where can we reasonably conclude that the reign takes place? We can reasonably conclude that the reign takes place in heaven. So who reigns? The souls of the martyrs. Why do they reign? Because they are victorious. And where do they reign? By using reason, we can logically conclude that they reign in heaven. The fourth question, when do they reign? Once again, we're not given direct information about when they reign, but there are some possible clues from the text. Chapter 19 saw the fall of the beast, which symbolized the Roman Empire. Now we need to remember that when John wrote the book of Revelation, he didn't divide it up into chapters and verses. Man did that many years later to make it easier to find things and so forth. Well, John didn't divide it into chapters. And so chapter 20 follows right on the heels of chapter 19. In chapter 20, the story continues with what followed the event in chapter 19, which was the fall of the beast, the Roman Empire. So the starting point for the thousand-year reign would be the fall of Rome. This fits perfectly, I believe, with the purpose of the reign, since it is a victory celebration of the martyrs over the ones who persecuted and killed them. Chapter 20 pictures the reign as taking place before the end of time. It's later in the chapter, verses 11 through 15, that the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment is presented. So let's do some math. I know, it's a Bible lesson and you're not supposed to have to do math, right? Well, let's do a little bit of math. A thousand years from the fall of Rome to the end of time. Rome fell somewhere around 476 or so. So 1476 should be when Jesus returned. Wait a second. Jesus didn't return in 1476, did he? I mean, because we're in 2020 now, and that's a lot later than 1476. That, so that can't be right. Well, some people say, well, but Rome never fully fell, and that it still exists, exists even today. Well, that's, you know, not necessarily a possibility. Rome did fall in 476. It fell as an empire never to have that same sort of influence and power ever again. So there has to be something different in interpreting the time and everything. Well, if we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it t Peter tells us that with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Aha! Maybe that's going to help us out. So if there are 365 and a quarter days in a year, that's one revolution of the earth around the sun, 365 and a quarter days in a year, and the rain lasts a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years, then we've got it figured out. 365,250 years after the fall of Rome will be the end of time. Voila! And so Jesus is going to return in the year 365,726. So since it is 2020, 
we are a mere 363,706 years from the return of Jesus. No way is it going to happen in our lifetimes. Well, that can't really be right either, though, can it? We are consistently told that no one, no angel, or even the sun knows when that day will come. No one. In Revelation 2, verse 10, it says that the persecution of the church in Smyrna would last 10 days. We know it didn't just last 10 days. It was a little bit longer than just 10 days. Maybe, just maybe, the thousand-year time frame is symbolic. Maybe 10 days is symbolic for a short time, and a thousand years is symbolic for a very long time. In fact, for a time long enough to forget the persecution suffered for the short time. Symbolically speaking, 10 days of suffering, thousand years of reigning. Sounds kind of like a pretty good trade-off to me, anyway. Now let's turn our attention to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 26. This passage makes it clear that when Christ returns, he will not be coming to start a reign at all. Notice the order of events that are given. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So let's see if we can figure out the order of events. Christ was raised the first fruits. That doesn't mean that Christ is the first person ever to be raised from the dead. I mean, Jesus himself raised Lazarus from the dead. What this means is that Christ is the first person to be raised from the dead, never to die again. Christ was raised the first fruits. Christ will return. That's the second thing. Then third, Christ will raise the dead. And fourth, then the end comes. When Christ will end his reign, and when Christ will hand over the kingdom to God. So the thousand year reign cannot be after Christ returns. As part of the story of the book of Revelation then, the thousand year reign follows the fall of the beast, the Roman Empire, and is before the resurrection and the judgment. It's separated from the end only by a short time, Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, when Satan is briefly released and tries to resume his persecution of Christians, but God quickly stops him and sends him to his final place, the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. So who reigns? The souls of the martyrs at the hands of the Roman Empire. Why do they reign? They reign because they are victorious over the persecution. Where do they reign? Well, they reign in heaven. And fourth, when do they reign? They reign from the fall of Rome to near the end of time. I hope this helps to explain and put into the proper context the thousand-year reign of Revelation chapter 20. I would urge you not to be sucked in by those saying that current events show that Jesus is about to return. Because as Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. God has already determined when that day, the last one, will be. And not even Jesus knows when it will be. Speaking of Matthew chapter 24, I hope you'll join me next time as we look at the signs of Matthew 24 and we see what there are signs of or if there are actually signs of anything. For now, let me close by saying that we can know two things for sure. Number one, Jesus is going to return. 
And number two, no one knows when he will. So we need to always, always be constantly ready when he does. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time.